How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. The average American eats 222 pounds of red meat and poultry, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. A new generation of companies and some of the world's most renowned chefs and restaurateurs are aiming to take a bite out of that hankering for a burger or steak and bring local fresh food to our restaurant tables. Coming up first on the show today, we'll learn about mock meat made from plants and grown in laboratories with Pat Brown, founder and CEO of Impossible Foods, maker of the plant-based Impossible Burger, Carolyn Young, author of the Food Gal blog, and Mike Selden, CEO and co-founder of Finless Foods, a startup that plans to make tuna that comes from a lab, not a fish. Later on, we'll hear what restaurants are doing to help people reduce their carbon food print. The new surf and turf, today on Climate One. So Mike Selden, let's begin with you. Um, how are you gonna make tuna without a fish? Cutting right to it, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, saying entirely without a fish is a little bit, uh, not 100% what we're doing, right? We are taking a small sample of meat from a real fish but the idea is one sample from one fish once, pulling it out of that fish, just isolating the cells that grow the fastest, and then growing them up in large quantities in the same way they grow inside of the fish. So these cells already exist inside of the system that we are taking them from, and in the system they already do this function, which is to become meat. We're just taking this process from inside of the fish and replicating it outside of the fish. So it is in every way, uh, replicating the same sensory experience of meat because it is really fish meat. And what stage is your company and when will there be products available? I think you're going to start with little pieces of sashimi, right? Uh, when will that, uh, when are you going to be out in the marketplace? Yeah, so we're a very young company. We just started last year. Um, we've already made some, some good progress, but we're still in an R&D stage. We're doing some initial sampling. Last year in September, we had the... Um, the first ever tasting of fish created without needing to kill any fish. And so back in September, we invited uh, 25 of our friends together in a test kitchen in, in uh, South San Francisco uh, called Les Left Coast Catering. And we all ate fish for the first time. And that was like really exciting. So since then, we've moved over to Emeryville, um, just over the water. And we now have a lab and a staff. And we're moving forward in order to basically drop our costs. Because really what we're doing is taking was previously medical technology, like 3D organ printing, and applying it to food. So the technology exists, it's just a matter of dropping the cost to the point where people can afford it. And so um, we intend to be on market, um, we intend to have a product ready for market by the end of 2019, um, but we'll probably see it actually available in mid-2020. Pat Brown, your company is more mature. It's what, gathered $300 million or so in fundings from, from some very big names. Uh, but tell us about your journey from Stanford medical professor to entrepreneur wearing a hip hoodie and you know, <laughs> you change your white coat for a green hoodie. So, For most of my adult life, I was uh, worked as a basic research scientist, molecular biologist. Um, I was at Stanford in the medical school for about 25 years uh, as a professor. And, um, and loved that job and had zero interest in uh, business and very little interest in food. I mean, I, 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 I like to eat food, but I don't think of it when I'm, think about it when I'm not eating it. And I certainly don't photograph it. Um, <laughs> so um, so it was, this was a very unlikely place for me to wind up, but I had a sabbatical uh, a little over eight years ago. Uh, that gave me time to sort of step back from what I was doing, which was, you know, basic molecular cell biology and genomics and cancer research and stuff like that, and, uh, and try to think of what's the most important thing I can do, what's, given the things I'm capa capable of doing, which is a limited set of things, uh, how can I have the highest positive impact on the plant? And I very quickly realized that uh, it was a no-brainer, that, that the use of animals as a technology for producing food 
is by such a humongous margin, nothing comes close, the most destructive technology on Earth. And it's not just climate change, which a lot of people know about. It's not just that it's incredibly water inefficient. Probably the most uh, destructive aspect of it is that uh, um, it, right now it occupies about 50% of its land area, either grazing or feed crops. Um, cows outweigh every wild animal, every wild vertebrate left on Earth by a factor of 10. And we are very, and, and the total number of living uh, wild animals on Earth, according to the World Wildlife Fund, has dropped by half in the past 40 years. There's half as many wild animals on Earth today, and that's pretty much across the board, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians. And it's almost entirely due to our use of animals as food. And what I realized was, you're not gonna solve the pro problem by telling people to change their diets. Just give up on that. And um, there is no better illustration than when I was in Paris during the COP21 um, climate talks, and you have the most committed, ardent environmentalists in the world coming together there. And at the end of every session, they'd go out and have a steak, okay? <laughs> I've and interviewed lots of people on this stage and then go out, watch them go out and eat meat afterwards. Yeah, yeah. so, and, they're, and these are really good people, really committed, um, uh, but it's just too hard, even for people who know the problem and care about it, to make that jump. And that basically meant that you have to solve the problem without requiring people to change their diets, and the only way to do it is to beat the incumbent industry in the market, develop a better technology that's much more sustainable, but it has to also produce more delicious, more nutritious, more affordable food, because that's how you win in the market. Trying to understand the fundamental mechanisms that underlie the flavors and textures and juiciness in biochemical terms so that once we understand the mechanisms, we can find plant-derived proteins that are more sustainable and uh, um, that have the same salient properties and make a product that outperforms meat in the ways that consumers care about. So you want to compete on performance, not on virtue. You're not after those, no. uh, the Berkeley vegans who are, right, okay. Um, and so, uh, Carolyn Jung, you write about food, flavors, the industry. You know, get, let's get your take on these, this array of these companies and, and where they are. There's other companies out there that are trying to have you know, different types of replaced shrimp or there's other things. So let's get your take on the landscape since you cover this from a food lover perspective. Well, can I first say it's quite intimidating between by being sandwiched between this kind of brain power on this <laughs> stage. <laughs> I feel totally inadequate. So, yeah, you're but, up to um, it. And I do photograph my food. I will tell you that. Right <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm not against that at all. I just don't do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah. I think um, it's a very exciting time because um, we have all these options now and we're harnessing the brain power and the technology of Silicon Valley, which is coming up with you know all kinds of incredible things we never would have imagined 10 years ago, 20 years ago, even maybe five years ago. Um, so the things that um, Pat and Mike are both creating are really exciting, and I think they're creating a buzz. Um, especially, you know, in the Bay Area, everybody is so interested in the latest, the greatest, the newest, hottest thing. They want to be the first to try it. And um, I know when the Impossible Burger first just came on the scene, there was just so much interest in it, um, especially because um, people were hearing that, oh my God, it, it bleeds and it has the texture of a burger and people can't really tell the difference. And I think that got a lot of people interested, not just um, vegetarians, but people who are diehard carnivores. Um, it's only appropriate that this be happening in the Bay Area, because, I mean, honestly, most of the food trends start here. Uh, the East Coast just thinks they have a claim to that, <laughs> but it's not really true. <laughs> it happens here first. So, um, I mean, I, as, a, as a, a writer who writes about food and just someone who loves to eat, um, I'm very intrigued by it, and also I kind of am interested in sort of what the future holds beyond that. Um, you know, what else is going to come up with this? Is the price point on these things going to be such that 
everybody can afford it because I think that's always a knock against things like this and even organics. That there's only a, you know, a certain population that can actually afford this and you know, they're frankly the ones who probably don't really need it. Um, so how does that all play out? Let's get, uh, talk about price. Uh, Pat, I think it's fair to say you have sort of the Tesla model. You sort of starting high at some fancy restaurants, and as you scale, the price will come down. Uh, where are you in, on that path to getting to kind of an affordable, uh, taking something that's luxury but making it more affordable? Within the next few years, with a very high degree of confidence that we will have a product that costs less to produce than any ground beef or any beef from a cow, we discovered that the uh, reason that meat tastes like meat, any kind of meat, beef, chicken, pork, you name it, the reason that you can recognize a food as being meat and nothing else, even if you've never eaten that particular species before, is a molecule called heme. It's a, a molecule that's found in every living cell on Earth, plants, animals, and so forth. But because it's basically a, 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 a component of, the, of most systems in which your body interacts with oxygen and, and the system that uses oxygen to burn, and burn to produce uh, energy that your body can use, um, animals have way more than plants do. Plants have hundreds of different heme proteins. I mean, spinach has more than 100 different, completely different heme proteins in it. Every you know, plant and animal has many, many heme proteins. In your average uh, daily diet, you're probably eating a thousand molecularly distinct heme proteins, okay? But how and about the FDA saying, oh, it's not, it didn't meet the, what they generally recognize as safe criteria? We are completely compliant with the FDA's food regulations. We started talking to the FDA probably about five years ago, well before we were, maybe at least two years before we were ever going to put a product in the market, because we knew that there would be concerns. We didn't, we, we knew that this was an intrinsically safe protein for reasons that, that, any, any biochemist would pretty much tell you, but the system is such that uh, if we get an expert panel to um, review all our data and, and uh, conclude that it's safe, um, that according to the FDA, we don't have to do anything else. We don't even have to show them the results. We did show them the results of that study. They asked for a couple of additional um, pieces of information which we have s since provided them We've had a wonderful interaction with them through this whole process, extremely constructive. And they have, if they had any concerns, real concerns about the safety of this food on the market, they would exercise the power that they have to ask us to remove it from the market. And they haven't because they just wanted more evidence in, in their formal process to assure the public that you know, every box was Checked. I don't want to speak for them, but I think that's the gist of it. So we've done that. So it's intrinsically safe. It's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the water, land, uh, energy use, greenhouse gas footprint. Well, then how about cost? Is this going to be an elite sort of coastal fancy sushi place uh, kind of thing for, for finless foods? And also the, the life cycle analysis. Have you done an analysis to say that your you know, tuna from a lab, the Im environmental impact overall versus uh, one that comes from the sea? Even if all we manage to do is to create a luxury product from this, we actually are making a large difference. And I can go into how we'll drop the cost in a second, but I just want to hit that point at first because um, people don't realize what an impact the like basically luxury market has on the world. I mean, the top 10% um, of people economically are the ones creating over 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions in terms of their lifestyle. And this is extremely in effect in a place like San Francisco where we are now. So what we're producing is bluefin tuna. Um, even if the only people who ever end up eating this are the San Franciscans who eat bluefin tuna right now. We get a lot of our bluefin tuna from countries like the Philippines, which no longer can afford to fish their own waters because we're buying it out from underneath them. So even if all we do are switch people in luxury markets over to something like this, it actually does make a difference. That said, we are trying to drop our cost all the way down to a commodity good. We're trying to actually bring this down so that everyone can afford it. What's the new frontier beyond farm to table? How can you spot greenwashing on menus? To discuss those questions, we welcome Gwyneth Borden, Executive Director of the Golden Gate Restaurant Association, Dominique Crenn, 
chef and owner of Atelier Crenn, which received three coveted Michelin stars, and Anthony Mint, co-owner of the Perennial Restaurant in San Francisco. Anthony Mint, how about your earliest memories in relationship to food? There's that connection with childhood and favorite foods. What were some of yours? Um, well, I grew up watching a lot of cooking shows with my grandmother, and I feel like in the suburbs, I wasn't really thinking about food politics and the food system at a young age, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, as I got older, recently we had a daughter, started thinking more about food and climate change and really wanting to use our platform in the food industry to make change. And as we kind of have gone down this path of learning about the potential for soil to really make a big difference and radically reverse climate change, uh, I think what has struck me the most is just how optimistic it is and how vast the potential is. And so farm to table has been well established. People know what that is. What, what's the next step, Anthony Mint? What's beyond farm to table? What's, where, where's the leading edge right now of that movement? Well, I hope we are. Farm to Table 1.0, if we can call it that. It's about fresh and local and nutritious and healthy. It's kind of like Know the Farmer. It's a little bit quaint, I would almost say, pastoral. Farm to Table 2.0 should incorporate all the best things of that, but I think it really needs to be focused on healthy soil as the world's most practical climate solution. And tell us about that. So soil, you know, uh, regenerating soil, how, how, you know, people don't think about soil. They take soil for granted. The beef that we'll be tasting a little bit later tonight, uh, it's from a ranch in Marin, California, um, a little bit north of the city. And the environmental benefit of the way the cows and the uh, rangeland scientists and the compost and the management, what that has accomplished in the last five years is something like the equivalent of not burning a million gallons of gas. So this is on one-tenth of one ranch, and there is two million times that much pasture in the United States alone. So I think if your mind goes towards numbers, you can immediately just kind of think like, oh my gosh, that's enormous. And maybe the problem is not beef, the problem is beef in feedlots that are being fed antibiotics and making the manure not usable. You know, if there's millions of acres of rangeland, it's not really land that's suitable for growing tomatoes and soybeans and stuff. The absolute best use from a food production standpoint is beef, and if beef can restore that land, just like planting trees, we have a real potential to save the world through how, our, how we eat and the choices we make. Dominique Crenn, you don't serve beef in your restaurants. You have a different view of the, of the cattle industry. Well, I think it was very conscious. Um, the beef industry in the United States is, um, I don't know if it's beef, first of all. <laughs> uh, I mean, seriously. Uh, but it's, it's kind of destroying, you know, um, a lot of things. I remember when I, and I read this article, and I kind of clicked in my head when I read this article about this company that went to the Amazon and cut down the tree just to put livestock um, of beef there because people were in demand of hamburger meat. That really, like, I was just like, are you serious? Are you crazy? <laughs> no, seriously, we have to think about this, you know? I mean, we live in an ecosystem. We live on the, on the planet. Everything needs to be balanced. Everything is connected with each other. It's not just about the human. It's about the way that we're treating, you know, the, the planet, the soil, and everything. So... It's just this greediness about uh, consumption is, it's killing, it's killing humanity, it's killing, you know, so I made a conscious this decision until we fix that problem, I'm going to do the things, I'm actually, I, I, I want to do things that I believe that right for, um, for us, first of all, for my customer, for the environment, for the, for the, for the climate, whatever, it's just I want to do the right thing. So beef will not be on my menu. Now, until things help. Until Anthony's yes. folks get become more <laughs> pr predominant in the beef <laughs> supply. Know, yes. Right. Gwyneth Borden, tell us about that, whether this is uh, really an elite thing for, for sort of high-end or, or, or well-endowed, well-capitalized restaurants. You know, how can the little person c deal with all this complexity and be green? Well, I think, you know, locally we have so many, we're lucky because we have access to amazing farms and produce and ranches. So we have natural product in season um, at times that other people don't. But, but locally people really make a concerted effort to get to know, 
you know, if the, what the water quality is, will I get my fish from there? How do I use vegetables that maybe aren't as sexy? Some of the, you know, think about some of the root vegetables. How do I incorporate root vegetables that may be less expensive for me to purchase in my food? How can I use the tops of my carrots or other parts of the entire vegetable, not throwing it away? Maybe I'm using the skin. So people are being really creative and looking at the issue of food waste specifically. How can they take tonight's dinner and repurpose that to, for tomorrow's lunch to make sandwiches? How can they, whether whether it's uh, how can they take an animal and do nose to tail, use the entire animal, and then make stocks and things from, from the bones. I mean, people are, are being very creative in the ways that they can to make a, a big difference. I mean, people here very much care about the quality of our food, and the quality of our food depends on our soil and our environment. I think we're lucky in the Bay Area that people have an understanding in that matter. Is it more expensive and hard? Are organics more expensive? Absolutely, they are. Um, and people make incremental choices. Some people choose to, to pay, buy organics in areas um, where it does make a big difference in taste and in terms of like where, where we know toxins are, are greatest, and then on other areas they don't. But as restaurants start to scale, especially if they have more than one location, they're in a better position with, with producers to negotiate better rates, or sometimes they can go in with another restaurant um, to kind of get better rates. But people are, you know, really making an effort. I'm not saying it's easy. Sometimes, again, when you don't have scale to buy products, you know, compostable products, whatever it might be, it can be very difficult. And that's why mandates are not, you know, really preferred in this space. But I understand why people feel like they're necessary. So, Dominique Cran, you're a celebrated, you know, chef internationally, uh, going carbon neutral. Does the, the sort of the elite food establishment, do they, do they notice that? Do they care about that? If we care about this? I mean, Being carbon neutral, do, do, the, do the Michelins and James Beards and those sorts of organizations of care course, about carbon yeah. neutral? So, yeah, it's not because we have Michelin and all that. It, it just doesn't define us. I think what defines us is what we do with it, you know. Um, I mean, we've been, we've been working, you know, obviously we, we, we're very lucky because we, we have a farm now. So we do a lot of things with the biodynamic and, and uh, organic farm and we... We take care of, of, like, for example, if we have, uh, you know, abalone shells or, or you know, oyster shells, it's go back to the soil and the farm. So it's just, we're doing a lot of, also a lot of fermentation. So, like, you know, if we have melon, the skin, you know, become, you know, vinegar. So we've, very, we've been very thoughtful, but it's been going on for a long, long time. And what it, what it was surprising when we, when, you know, Anthony and I talk, and I was very surprised that a lot of people, don't do this. I mean, a lot of restaurants, they say that, you know, they farm to table, but when you really look at it, they don't really care. And, you know, I think... It's hard work. It's, it's harder. Well, I mean, yeah, but it's, it's worth it. When you see how, how much West restaurants have with, like, this big, you know, West garbage bag, you know, where that garbage bag going? You know, there's a lot of things going on. So I think it's, it's, it's we have to start and being conscious about everything that you, we do. You know, I think we, we, we've been living in a so society, especially in the restaurant business, it's all about instant gratification. And people want us to write long menus and you need to have this on the menu and this. And No, we need to do in a place where we are in charge. We writing the menu in a way that it's available that we know exactly where the food comes from, that is seasonal, that is local, and then I hope that the people would be willing to come and eat. You know, it's like, I think we need to change the, the, uh, our own habit and the culture, and it doesn't, you know, you need to start at home. Do you ever get overwhelmed or despair about the, the fate of the world? You know a lot, Dominique Crenn, about the oceans, the, 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 where the earth, the math is dark, the times are dire. Do you ever get despondent about that? You know, I'm I'm a very um, positive nature. I get I don't get depressed very easily. Um, no matter of fact, it makes me want to do more of what's going on right now. Um, so it motivates you. I just totally motivate me, in me because I know that I do have a responsibility for the future, for the future generation. It's so important. You know, um, it's um, it's it's exciting. It's really exciting. And you know what exciting is, is when you talk to youngsters and when they are willing to listen to it also. It's very exciting to see that they also want to change it, you know. 
We're going to go to our lightning round and ask our guests uh, some quick questions, starting with true or false, uh, Gwyneth Borden, <laughs> Chinese restaurants are slower to adopt environmentally friendly practices than other restaurants. <laughs> That's always a... <laughs> <laughs> Dominique, do you want to answer that? Truth. Truth. Uh, Anthony Mint, organic crops require application of more pesticides and insecticides <laughs> than traditional crops. True or false? Uh, I don't know that. Uh, Dominique Crenn, uh, cooking is activism. <laughs> right. Truth. <laughs> uh, Dominique Crenn, some people think you should shut up and cook. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you plan to do. <laughs> oh, no, I'm never going to shut up. <laughs> and I still cook, so that's okay. This is association. I'll mention a noun, something, and the first thing that pops to your mind, unfiltered, uh, Anthony Mint, GMOs. I'm in favor of natural breeding. That was a long word. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, first thing that comes to your mind, Dominique Crenn, foie gras. No comment. <laughs> Gwyneth Borden, kale. That is great for you. <laughs> uh, Gwyneth Borden, big food. Big food. Big food can help move the country forward. They have to take on their responsibility. Anthony Mint, your favorite cheese. Ooh, uh, I really like Bria Severin. That's uh, French. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dominique Crenn, your favorite vegetable. Oh, a uh, tomato. I mean, it's tomato. Is a fruit. It's a fruit <laughs> vegetable. Yeah, a tomato. It's umami. It's it's <laughs> it's amazing, sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Dominique Crenn, the best food to help a hangover. I don't know. I never have a hangover. <laughs> All right, let's give them a round for getting through that lightning round. <laughs> I think we failed. <laughs> Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows recorded with a live audience are available wherever you podcast. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time, everybody. Mm -hmm.